Hi there, Steve Hackett here, going to play you something from Trick of the Tail. Sped up guitar on the introduction, I was playing at half speed, and then it gets joined by Mike and Tony. Very sort of typical, uh, typical Genesis feel on this one. Guitars chiming away. Freudian slumber. I was thinking about a psychiatrist at the time hypnotizing a patient and taking him back into a world of troubling dreams. Phil Collins at the time, I think with the over the rooftops and houses thing, said he thought it had a, a Mary Poppins feel, maybe a sort of Chim Chimri Taru thing, but I think it was dealing with, with sort of deeper issues than that. Um, the song, the lyrics are basically mine. Um, what sounds like the chorus is really Tony Banks, but um, uh, nonetheless, it's my lyric that, that wraps the whole thing together and then you know floats off into something much bigger towards the end. But you've got issues of psychiatrists and couches and a guy being hypnotized. Many years later, after I've been playing thousands of shows, I, I hit a reef and I, started to get stage fright um, after I played with an orchestra live and uh, I saw a, a psychiatrist myself who um, gave me some hypnotherapy and I didn't realize I didn't realize that I was actually very successfully hypnotized and um, the more this guy talked about positives and about how good I was at what I was doing, um, I started weeping openly in front of this guy and I said, well, that must be very unusual. And he said, actually, it's very common. It's because when you're hypnotized, you don't have the usual emotional blocks because I don't normally burst into tears in front of complete strangers, but I remember... Terry Jones of Monty Python is doing exactly the same when he was hypnotized on TV. Anyway, I hope you still love the song. I do. Thank you. A lot of people have asked for this one. Ripples from The Trick of the Tale. Uh, you've got to remember that this was Phil Collins' first attempt at singing lead vocals with Genesis. Of course, I knew he had a great voice. Uh, we auditioned lots of other singers, but really, to have a singer of this quality within the ranks was uh, uh, an opportunity that was too good to pass up on. When I first saw the band live, Peter Gabriel and Phil were singing together. I thought it was a, an automatic double track on, on Pete's vocals. They sound so similar. They both have big rock voices. I think that that's really important that the Genesis had this ability to have um, quiet moments um, and then loud moments, the dynamics of which I think characterized the band very much in those, those early days. So to be able to write iconic choruses or things that sounded like choruses that um, didn't necessarily repeat the words, but here comes the big bit, all of that. And of course, there's, um, there's an instrumental section coming in which features some guitar work from me that sounds like it's backwards but actually it isn't it's um synthy high fly which locked off the beginning of the note and making it sound backwards so you've got that going turn it up a little bit and then Tony's keyboards kicking in so you've got synth you've got it backed by piano um, Maybe the sort of poignancy of uh, the song comes from this this section, but in a way, of course, you know the big the big moment is in the uh, Phil singing "Sail Away," that whole thing, which I think probably influenced Enya later on with "Sail Away, Sail Away," her first big hit single, all of that, and um, I think there's so much that's typically Genesis. 
of this, you know, long songs. I think when, when I first joined the band, you know, we were doing six songs per album, and then you could argue with Landmines Down, you know, it was four songs per album, four, four sides linked. But this is the beginnings of all of that. Thank you. Hi everybody, Steve Hackett here. Uh, I'm going to talk about Foxtrot and in particular Supper's Ready that of course is many people's favourite moment. That's Pete really giving his all on vocals here. Funny how this all came together. Um, we were rehearsing at a place called Unibillings TV School of Dance, where you had all these kids who were learning to dance upstairs. So you had the sound of that breaking through the ceiling. Meanwhile, we were doing this very kind of, um, I guess it's Genesis at its most adult with all these kind of philosophical themes so many things and I think it marks the beginning of the band moving into what was known by the Americans as theatrical rock. I think it's because we were presenting the band with a light show, with a singer who was depicting the action, a sort of white muslin backdrop and ultraviolet lights. So you've got the full whack of it and um, I know that Peter Gabriel and I were, were very keen on um, if we were going to do something the length of Supper's Ready in front of new audiences it really had to engage visually as well as musically so um, I think it marks a change with the band taking a leap into the unknown but I remember doing this for the first time in, in London at the Rainbow Theatre and um, when the concert started there was a guy in the audience started out over the, the strains of the keyboards that picked off um, he said um, shouted out Genesis is the best band in the world and I remember uh, Richard McPhail who was mixing sound out front afterwards saying and for that moment in time the band was the best band in the world. I certainly felt I was playing guitar in the world's best band at that time. Hi guys, Steve Hackett here, going to play you something from Wind and Wuthering, Blood on the Rooftops. Often get asked about this one and asked to play the, uh, the guitar front, the intro to it. Um, I came up with a song um, with the idea of all the levels of action happening on the on the TV. Um, I wondered whether I'd be able to do a long introduction on guitar. Uh, um, the guys all seemed to like it, so it became part of the song. And of course, I've recorded various versions of this live, so you can watch DVDs of me either doing it at home or on stage. Um, something about the song, again it's the word English coming up, very much a song in, in black and white, English TV, limited channels, but channel surfing nonetheless, when composing the lyric, all these references to Different, different characters and, and scenes but essentially it's, it's two guys father and son watching TV together um, the son is pretty much open to watching anything but the father having lived through a world war or two really doesn't want the news he doesn't want death and destruction so his stance is kind of apolitical. It's going to hurt him at the chorus now. I have to 
fade it down a little to talk over. But um, um, I was trying to be controversial when I was writing the lyric, and um, there are many things that I'd heard in conversation. And I thought, I wonder if that can that can work in a lyric. You know, um, the idea of uh, when we got bored, we'd have a world war. Uh, but I think it defines this very black and white album known as Wind and Wandering. Hi there, Steve here. Want to uh, play something that you'll recognize. Lovers of the Lamb will recognize this straight away. The Lamia. Yeah? Um, it's funny, you know, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, you have this New York setting. And of course, it, it's also, the contradiction is it's a mythological journey for Rail, the imagined character. And you have this song that is, I think, at its most romantic, most romantic part of the of the land. Um, although it's a New York setting, you have this idea of the character wandering into this realm of female temptresses. The Greek idea of the, the Lamia um, subject matter that wasn't. Um, unknown to the to the pre-Raphaelite artists who were very fond of this kind of image of these sort of girl women that look very innocent and sweet on the surface but un underneath the uh, the underlying idea is that of course they are potentially lethal so it, in a way it's that kind of poetic contradiction of the two and um, it's part of Rail's journey. But in a way, I, I, I personally was very uh, drawn to this. You know, in, in the midst of the, of the urban angst that was driving Rail and, and the character and the band at that time, um, I think there were two, two types of genesis. There was this forward motion thing, but then there was always the nostalgic looking backwards that characterized so much of the band's work and um, I think this song embodies those contradictions and you get this very whimsical impressionistic moments and the magic that a name would stain beautiful Beautiful lyrics from Pete, absolutely gorgeous. Still love it. Hi there, Steve Hackett here. Uh, today I'm talking about Cinema Show. And of course, yes, you've seen the mug with the uh, famous picture on the Betty Swanick picture, which is my favorite, uh, favorite album cover of Genesis. And um, very, very beautiful, very lovely, very English. Um, yeah. Cinema show. A lot of people have asked about that, and its and its history, its progeny. Um, I have to say that it was when it was originally put together, it was linked to Dancing with the Moonlit Night. We had a very sort of contentious meeting about this at the time. I remember Phil saying, "Well, if there's a twelve-string passage in something, does it mean that?" You know, every long song has to have a 12-string passage in it. And there were some crestfallen faces. So we started to do some long songs that didn't have 12-string passages in. But, you know, it's, it's very, a very beautiful combination, I think, of um, 12 strings and, uh, and keyboards. So the famous melody and... Um, of course, in a way, It always deserved to be heard live to get the full impact of, of this. Last time I did it with my band, we actually raised the roof. I've never heard anything so loud in my, my life that bass pedals were enough to bring the ceiling down. And those famous Mellotron voices, of course, we just acquired the Mellotron voices. I pushed the band into getting a Mellotron 
way back in the day, and of course we put our original one off of, uh, off of King Crimson, but the Mellotron voices hadn't really been invented at that point, and um, uh, I remember Mellotronics said to us, oh, there's some very interesting stuff you might like to come down and, and, and hear, and uh, Tony Banks and I went down to listen to their latest stuff, and it was male and female voices mixed and you could get them separately if you wanted. So, you know, of course we opted to have the full whack of, of them all together. And I, I think, you know, in a way it's, um, it's a very beautiful song, very romantic, but I think the cinematic effect, the soundtrack effect really comes from the instrumental stuff and uh, um, Tony's extraordinary keyboard work on this. But once again, we have to fade out to memory. Thank you, everybody. Hi there, Steve Hackett here. I'm going to play you my favourite Genesis track from my favourite Genesis album. Part of it, anyway. I'm sure lots of you recognise this. Dancing with the Moonlit Night. It's... <clears throat> For me, it reigns supreme of all Genesis songs because it goes from so many different styles. It starts off with Scottish plain song at the front, Can You Tell Me Where My, where my Country Lies? And then it's into that Elgarian thing, Citizens of Hope and Glory, Land of Hope and Glory, addressing all the Brits and the idea of corporations taking over. And I think it's a lovely tune, but it grows into so much more by the time it gets to the instrumental it doesn't just you know waffle off into that it goes into something that i think has got aspects of you hear the, the voices here in the background overhanging something that's those monotron voices have got a, a hint of a mozart Requiem, and then you get into um, this very angular riff played on Mellotron cellos and distorted piano that's, I think, worthy of Prokofiev. This is Tony's riff here. There's all of that, and then you get the guitar moments, tapping, sweep picking, octave jumps, and I think the whole thing is bound together with Phil's extraordinary drumming. Um, a jazz rock drummer let loose amongst all these different styles that are going on. You know, you've got part rock, you've got part classical. Um, can't play you the whole tune, that would take all night. But um, by the time it comes to the end of the song, You've got this kind of resigned, almost like garden gnomes fading out on the very end. Hi everybody, I'm going to talk to you about Musical Box from Nursery Crime. Uh, the very first track I ever did with Genesis. And let's cue up some of the... Uh, as it starts to build towards the end of the track. Again, I think it's that thing about that Genesis where you get a very long song that builds and builds and builds. You get these sort of series of crescendos. Finally, Hitting with this bit that we did on Seconds Out, of course, the most memorable bit perhaps of the song, but there's so much more to it. Very English, but got Pete at his most insistent and, and urgent. You know, 
There's something about this. Um, many years later, I met Brian May, who said that uh, he'd been influenced by the guitar work on this and stuff that's coming up. There's a three part guitar solo, three part harmony. This stuff here. It's funny, isn't it? Because um, I, I had no idea that Queen had listened to what we done at this time. It's something that oof, oof, oof. Sorry, I I meant to be talking over all that and I, I thought yeah I just have to let that music go because it it really speaks for itself, doesn't it? You know that feeling of uh, the crescendo, the peak of of the song with something that's quintessentially English, but at the same time, you know, you've got nurseries, haunted nurseries, and um, this kind of Victoriana and, and eroticism all kind of mixed in together um, in that very impressionistic, rambling way that Genesis did at that time. But I still love the track, and I get to play it as many times as I can live because I still love it. Thank you. Hi there, here's another one of my favourite tracks from one of the favourite albums, Please Don't Touch This Time, and this one is the title track. It's got a certain something, isn't it? Of course, I may have to fade it down whilst I talk annoyingly over it, just like a DJ. So, uh, I'll just take it down so I'm not competing with it. Um, that was the second album, second solo album, just after I'd, I'd left Genesis. Um, I was recording it in 1977. It came out in 78. And this track, um, like the other one I did in the, in the other video, um, Shadow of the Hierophant, this track, Please Don't Touch, was another track that was rehearsed by Genesis at one point. Now, of course, Hierophant was, um, rehearsed during the the foxtrot sessions all that time ago um please don't touch was rehearsed up during the um the wind and wuthering sessions and um i felt very strongly about it and i, I felt it was i thought it's a very strong track originally it was linked to what gorilla um but personally i felt that this was the stronger i mean you know i, I felt because it was full of my themes, of course, you know, um, I felt this was the one we ought to go with, but you know, it's got all those quirky moments, tricky time signatures. I guess, you know, you could say it was typically progressive, but um, you know, it's just got, you know, something about it. Um, uh, the harmonies are almost oriental, and then it moves into this section whereby there's a kind of influence of Dave Brubeck and take five, to get the five, four section and all of that, but I felt that there was something really kind of, um, really manic about it. But um, when I was working with Tom Fowler, who played bass on it, Tom said, oh, this reminds me of some of the stuff that we used to do with Frank. Famously, of course, he was working with Frank Zappa, as had Chester Thompson at the time. So let's just turn this up so you get an idea of some of the more, more out there stuff with it. the Dave Brubeck influence, but I still feel it, it stacks up very well. So I'm still very fond of it, and I'll just let it go up with a loud bit. And then I have to fade very quickly to go up to the three minute mark. Thank you guys, thank you. God bless. Hi there, Steve Hackett here. Um, what I'm gonna do is do a series of videos about various tracks on favorite albums, favorite tracks uh, that go way back in my history and uh, I thought I'd start with the the very first album I did with the help of uh, some of the Genesis guys Voyage of the Acolyte from 1975 when I was still a member of the band but you know I had uh, Mike and Phil from the band on this album and uh, Sally Oldfield uh, I'm going to start with the uh, with the last track or, or part of it which is Shadow of the Hierophant and uh, I'm just going to try and fade it in and out. Hope you catch the uh, the whole effect of this. Here we go. So, uh, 
as some of you may know, this is a kind of a long crescendo. I was thinking, you know, I could add more and more instruments as it as it goes, um, and um, I I feel in a way, you know, there was something about this that's kind of timeless, and it became different things with different bands. You know, when I was playing it live in, in recent years, um, we let the drums go more and more manic. I mean, this particular version of the thing was found in my dad's shed. We had this monitor mix that was um, it was there and lost for 30 years and then unearthed, you know, up, like out of an Egyptian tomb. Um, but at the time, uh, it was really a monitor mix to be able to hear the drums and they were considered to be maybe a little bit too loud. Of course, things have changed since then where, where drums became king over time. So, uh, you know, this reflects the time that we were in when that was, when that was going on. Um, I'm still very fond of the album. It was my brother's debut on flute. Um, Sally Oldfield was on it. Um, uh, uh, Mike's lesser known sister. But um, I think that it worked, it worked very well. And uh, I will be going through a number of tracks with other albums. So I'll just fade it out now and, and, uh, and leave you with the memory of that. Or even turn it up a bit perhaps. And um, you can hear what it was. Uh, what it was heading towards all those years ago. I have to shout if it gets any louder, what can I do? Hey! Groove away! I'll do a manual fade. 17 minute track. Thank you guys.